Hey, thanks, Sam. Uh, we're happy to have you all with us today, and this is a different kind of a webinar. Normally, when you turn tune into a webinar, you're looking to learn about new material. This, instead, is a peace of mind program. Our goal is to do a recap of the noteworthy developments in the operations compliance arena for the last 12 months so that you can ensure you have covered all of the bases and that nothing has slipped through the cracks. So with that in mind, we give you short summaries of each of the developments that have occurred along with a link to a web page that has links to the underlying documents from the regulators or whatever the relevant source happens to be. So you'll see the link on on page one. You know, in terms of good news, for those of you who wear both the operations compliance and lending compliance hats, you know that it has been a very trying time to be in lending compliance. Uh, for those of you who only wear the operations compliance hat, you know full well that that doesn't mean that there hasn't been a lot going on in the operations arena. So. Um, we start with useful tools, and we round these up every year. These are things that bankers develop or uh, our bankers online staff does. They're things that are helpful, cheat sheets, spreadsheets, um, reminders, all kinds of, of resources to help you comply. And if you haven't ever checked out the Banker Tools section, I urge you to do so. If you're good at developing these types of things, I urge you to, to uh, consider sharing with other members of the Bankers Online community. There are three tools this year. I'll talk about uh, the first one, and then I'll let John talk about the next two. The Reg CC Funds Availability Calendar is a perennial favorite, and it's updated each year to include the holidays. It helps to ensure that you don't make a mistake in the timing when you apply a hold to deposited funds. So with that, John, tell us about the other two tools. Well, the second tool that, uh, that we've got on our list of, of, gr of great tools this year is the Federal Garnishment Calculator. And one of our enterprising uh, Bankers Online uh, readers and participants was the one who originated this particular tool. It does things like calculate um, the date by which you have to do start your um, analysis of an account or look back on an account. It uh, reminds you of the requirements uh, for uh, checking out to see whether or not you've got direct deposits with the, with the required double X and the other uh, information in the uh, the ACH uh, fields, and it also uh, helps you establish the uh, protected amount in an account if there is going to be a protected account. Uh, it's really a, a, a tool that's designed to help you from um, the beginning of receipt, from the, your receipt of that garnishment that's subject to the rule, all the way through to the point where you um, are completing your answer to the garnishing party. Uh, it's a really handy calculator. The second one is not so much a, well, I'll, I'll call it a tool. Uh, it's really a guided tour through a series of steps. Um, that you can use on the internet to identify the RSSD numbers, and don't even think about asking me what RSSD stands for, uh, the RSSD numbers that are assigned to your individual branches. And why do you want to know that? Well, uh, because uh, one of the fields that's required to be completed on a currency transaction report uh, is the um, is the ID number for the individual branch where the transaction or the branches where the transactions occurred. And part of that identity is this actual RSSD number, which is assigned to most banks on a uh, 
branch by branch basis. Uh, interesting fact that our SSD number is something that stays with the branch even if the branch gets transferred to another bank. Uh, so it's, it stays with the building, if you will. As I understand it, credit unions um, are assigned a single RSSD for their entire organization, even if they have more than one branch. But you need to know what these n numbers are in order to accurately and completely complete a currency transaction report um, to be filed with FinCEN. Um, on the lessons from the JPMC enforcement order, I think it's always helpful to look at something like this and see, okay, this one happened to do with compliance risk, AML and OFAC compliance. So you can look at this and kind of spin it around and tell yourself, well, maybe we should do some of these things on a proactive basis, like looking at the scope and frequency of our compliance risk assessments, reviewing our policies, procedures, and compliance risk management standards, looking at duties of personnel in the, in the realm of BSA, OFAC, and and compliance in general, and looking at uh, have we established new locations, have we established new delivery methods for our products and services, have we launched any new products and services, those are all things that affect your risk profile, and because of that, each time you have that kind of change, you need to reevaluate what your staffing needs are and whether you have the right people in the right slots and whether they have the uh, requisite amount of training. In the material on the top of page two, also from that same um, enforcement order, you see an emphasis on having clear lines of authority between, uh, between departments, business lines, whatever you might want to call it, and uh, having company-wide standards for AML compliance, and then the um, emphasis on policies, procedures, and processes. You have to have things in place that, that just work. You know, this is just the way we do it. We always perform the following steps at the following junctures. So um, that's uh, that's why that's instructive. On OFAC issues, John, I remember the days when we used to check the OFAC list on a manual basis. I say we, those uh, in most of the banks that I was aware of, those days are pretty much long gone for the majority of financial institutions, and we have never seen as much OFAC activity as we have in the past year, and the activity falls into several realms. One is they did a lot of updates of the uh, SDN list, the list of specially designated nationals, more than six dozen, and um, some of those weren't so much additions or deletions to the SDN list as they were changes to the sanctions program. And the sanctions programs are kind of uh, the uh, stepchild uh, in the OFAC world, but they're so crucially important. And you have to make sure that those within your institution, <clears throat> excuse me, have an awareness of the countries and the the regimes and the the uh, types of things that are subject to the sanctions program so that when a transaction does arise or when there's an, a customer that is related to one of the countries or whatever it might be affected by a sanctions program, that people know to put their OFAC hat on or go to the OFAC compliance officer to say, hey, if we do this, is this going to be a problem? So. The activity level was uh, pretty much unprecedented. And then the penalty actions included some that we felt were particularly noteworthy. OFAC um, updated or added to its Q&As, its FAQ on the site. And then they also came out with a fuzzy logic tool 
in the search field. So if you have people who are maybe out and about at a closing table.